Well, one of the reasons he gives signs is so that you don't end up like this church. It's 2017. It's September. The great sign is forming right above them. And what are they talking about? Open your Bibles to the book of, please be Luke, please be Luke 17, or, or the Olivet Discourse in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Heck, I'll settle for Revelation 6 seal. No, not Nehemiah. Not when there's a sign from God right over your head. And they completely missed it. Unbelievable. Well, Anyway, there's a cool pastor in there because he wears blue jeans and has tattoos. So let's, let's give him a nice motorcycle. That's a nice look. There, there's a cool pastor in that church. Yeah, but he's dead. This channel exists now for one reason, as a warning. That that was not the reason it existed for almost three years. For two and a half plus years, we were just gathering information, and it was like, wow, this is unbelievable. Teaching us stuff we didn't know. Most notably, this. The most important sentence in end-time prophecy for the church today. Right there. Right there. You never in your life ever heard a pastor or prophecy teacher, if Paul were still alive, he'd throw all of them out of the church, by the way, for leading you and me or trying to away from the Lord's teaching. But regardless, you have never heard a sermon about that sentence right there. Never. I recently watched a long video from a well-known prophecy teacher He's dead now, so I'm not going to drag his name through the mud because they're all guilty. I don't know of one that isn't guilty. Anybody who gives money to these people, you need to rethink that. You're abetting and enabling these people who are leading the church away from the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ about his coming. And you should not be supporting that idea. So this guy is going through verse by verse through the Olivet Discourse. He's going to go through Matthew, then Luke, verse by verse. And I know what he's going to say when he comes to this. He's going to say that's a display, cosmic display or cosmic disturbance. That's what they all do, because that's how they keep their story straight. They won't tell you the truth about that. Well, he, he surprised me. He was going through Matthew. He gets to this verse, and you know what he said about that? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> the single most important sentence in end-time prophecy, and he doesn't have a comment about it. I mean, he, would, he spent about an hour just to get to where this verse is in Matthew. It's in all of them. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that's very strange for this sentence to be in all of them, the exact same Greek words every single time. The only difference is in Luke, the word for precedes it because it's referring back to the third sign. It's the reason of the third sign for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I thought, well, maybe he's waiting for it to show up in Luke and there. Same thing. Twice. This sentence goes by, and he has nothing to say. Man, oh man, was that a microcosm of what's happening in the church. It is absolutely stunning. And the more I think about this verse, and I have said in the past, I don't think you can understand what this verse is, because I didn't know either. Okay? So who am I to be pointing fingers? Because I never walked away from his teaching. I'll pat myself on the back for that. I just didn't understand this verse or understand the importance of this verse. I knew that once we understood the book of Revelation, it would validate what he was saying in the Olivet Discourse, but there were a lot of things in Revelation I did not understand. And I now realize that if you don't understand that this is war in heaven, 
You won't understand it until you understand the importance of war in heaven in the book of Revelation. And then you'll start putting it together. And then when you come over here to the Olivet Discourse, you'll see how important an event this is because this is always followed by the same great event. This statement in all three versions immediately followed with, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming with great power and glory, and he will send his angels out to gather his elect. That's how important this event is. But now I'm beginning to realize this was designed to be sitting there in the Olivet Discourse for nearly 2,000 years, waiting to be revealed in these last days, in these final moments of the times of the Gentiles. That's why we didn't understand it in the past. The Revelation 12 sign was designed to shine light on that verse. I now get that. If this church, all churches, were paying attention to the great sign, the Revelation 12 sign, and realized this is something special, this is something we've got to figure out, but what does it mean? Why, why are we seeing something from the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. And you think about all of the highly intelligent pastors and theologians out there with the combined brain power and, and education that they have. It would not have taken long for one or many of them to go, well, let's do it this way. In, in, in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, this sign that John sees that we apparently just saw ourselves is leading to war in heaven. That's why he's looking. He is, he is being shown this picture of the woman and her seed, and the dragon hates the woman and her seed. And it's setting up the backstory to tell us that that's going to lead to war in heaven. That's what it's doing in Revelation 12. But the question we would have is, why is war in heaven important to us? Why is he pointing to war in heaven now? Why? why? Of all the things he could point to, why is he pointing to war in heaven? And it wouldn't have been long before someone said, well, notice in Revelation 12, it talks about the red dragon sweeping a third of the stars to him, and they get cast to earth. Look over at the uh, sixth seal. We see those stars falling to earth. Is the sixth seal saying that it opens with war in heaven being completed? Is that what's going on? And then somebody else would have said, well, look over here at the Olivet Discourse. The Lord talks about stars falling from heaven, and it's always followed with, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's war in heaven. Oh my goodness, we were wrong. We thought that was like cosmic display or disturbance right before his appearance. It's war in heaven. Oh my goodness, we've been teaching that the Lord's coming at the Olivet Discourse was the one at the very end. Right before he sets up the millennial kingdom, we were wrong. Because if it's war in heaven, that is the triggering event here, it happens before the beast even comes out of the sea. Oh my gosh, we've, we've, we've told the people some misinformation. When he sends his angels out to gather the elect at the Olivet Discourse, he's talking about the church. This is the fulfillment of Hebrews 9. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That's what he's referring to in the Olivet Discourse. That's the next coming, and it's in the Olivet Discourse. And then finally someone said, look at the signs that he gives right before this event. There will be signs in sun, moon, and stars, and we just saw one the Revelation 12 sign. That's how it was supposed to go. But the church turned its back. And now here we are, having squandered this time that he gave us. We have squandered six years and five months since the Revelation 12 sign and done nothing to correct our eschatology and to get ready for the coming of the Lord because he gives instructions about his appearance. Just like he gave instructions in the first century to those Christians in the Jerusalem area and surrounding areas of how they could save themselves, 
He gives us instructions and no one's paying attention. In the next video, I want to talk about this unique connection between the instructions in the first century and the instructions that he's giving us 2,000 years later. And in both cases, you better be listening. If you were not listening carefully in the first century, it cost you dearly. And friends, brothers and sisters, I am telling you, it's delusional for you to think that if you do not listen to his instructions about his soon coming, to think that you're going to get the optimum result, the best possible result on that day, you are delusional. That's not how it's going to work. Eagerly awaiting him means we're listening and we're watching for the things he said to watch for and we're ready to do the things he said to do. Church is not doing that. And it's a terrifying situation. And the quicker you get it, the quicker you can start helping other people because the church apparently is not going to help you because a giant sign appeared right over them, and they didn't have a word to say about it. If they did have a word to say about it, it was to poo-poo it. Oh, look, someone stole his motorcycle. Oh, well. Seriously, for those of you that are just kind of stopping through here and don't know anything about the history of this channel, you need to ask yourself a serious question, which is, yeah, why don't I listen to the Lord's teaching? Why, why don't I hear about it? Why is it that when I read Luke 17, when he talks about his revealing, that that, that event looks foreign to me? Why, why is that? And some of you may know the answer. Some of you may not. But the first answer that will, will come is that, well, when he talks about his coming in the Olivet Discourse, he's talking about his second coming at the very end. Set up millennial kingdom, judge the nations and all that. This sentence proves that thinking wrong, dead. That's why you will never hear your favorite prophecy teacher, I can barely spit it out, or your favorite church tell you that this is war in heaven because if they do, their eschatology gets revealed for the crap that it is. That's why. The second thing you might come up with is, well, yes, the Lord's talking about this, this coming that's not associated with us. See, Paul told us a mystery. See, Paul told us a secret. that The rapture of the church is kind of a secret event that Paul revealed. That idea is one of the biggest lies the church has ever told. That is absolute garbage. When Paul says, I show you a mystery, and then he talks about the rapture, he is not. That Greek word does not mean he's revealing something that nobody else knew until that very moment. That is absolutely insane, and they all know it. They all know it. They know that's a manipulation of you, because they know that's not what mystery means. Musterion. That's not what it means. The plan of God from ages past has contained mysteries. Yes, the rapture of the church is one of the mysteries, but Paul is not saying he's revealing it. He's just noting that it's one of the mysteries. There are multiple mysteries that are ongoing. It would be fair for me today to say the rapture of the church is a mystery of God. Absolutely correct statement. But there are other mysteries. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. The Messiah is a mystery. It is part of the mysterious plan of the Lord. It is part of God's plan. He's not saying, I'm revealing the Messiah to you right now. Of course not. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Our inclusion into God's family is a mystery. Again, Paul is not revealing anything. He is, re he is talking about ongoing mysteries. 
that were always a part of God's plan. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Again, it's a mystery ongoing. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Is Paul the first one to reveal the gospel? No, it's an ongoing mystery. And there are other other examples of this in the New Testament about the mystery of God. If you can't see that they've manipulated this word to get you to believe that Paul told you an event that the Lord never mentioned is ridiculous. Paul is talking about the same event that is mentioned by the Lord at the Olivet Discourse. He even credits the Lord the first time he ever mentions the rapture of the church. But, look, it's up to you. There's a spirit of delusion that is heavy in the world these days. You see it with your secular friends, and I see it in the church. And if you can't see what I have just shown you, good luck to you. And I mean that. I'm not being sarcastic. Good luck to you. I don't think it's going to work in your favor. We'll have more on that in the next video. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is so much different than what I have just said that I don't want to combine the two because what I have just told you is truth and it's deadly, serious, urgent truth. What I'm about to say is speculation and fun. So I want to make sure you understand we're moving from serious truth to a little more of a lighthearted, hey, isn't this kind of interesting segment, okay? And to do that, let's have an official intermission that'll, that'll kind of delineate the two parts of this video. And now, before the next show starts, let's enjoy an intermission. Okay, so just for fun, yesterday as I was coming home, walking back home, I was thinking to myself, well, you know what? The, the times of the Gentiles is going to be about 2,000 years. A little bit short. If the, if, the, if the times of the Gentiles began at the Great Commission, which it did, that stunning turn of events where the Lord says, now go into all the nations. He had not said that before. Before it was only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now go into all the nations. Times of the Gentiles was beginning. So figure that was, what, 33 A.D.? You know, that, that seems to be the most popular date of when the Lord was crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended. And so it was in that time frame that he gave the Great Commission. So we, we'd fall a little short of 2,000 years. And then I thought, well, what about prophecy years, prophetic years? Yeah, there's actually a Wikipedia article on prophetic years. In, in the book of Revelation, we are told three and a half years, three different ways. Time, times, and half time. 42 months, or eight months, 42, 3, 26, 42 months, and 1,260 days. 1,260 days you can only get to with prophetic years. A prophetic year would be 360 days. So a time, one 360-day period, times two 360-day periods, and half a time will get you 1260. You can only get to that number by using prophetic years. So I said, hey, just for fun, when I get home, I'm going to see how many prophetic years it's been since he gave the Great Commission. Now, as you know, this channel is named the 1111 sign because in 2018, for four months, I had the most ridiculous experience with 1111. I've never had anything like this happen before. It was three months into it before I realized other people around the world were and had been seeing it as well. And I was so relieved. I was like, oh, it's a thing. I didn't know. I thought it was like some more dire warning from God. I didn't know what he wanted. So then I started, because both Christians and non-Christians have seen this sign. Uh, and I told him, I know there's at least a meaning. There's probably multiple meanings for it. What, what, what is it? Why did you show me that? If you show me that, I'll do a video so people who are seeing it might have some, you know, reference to what's going on here. 
It took like a year and a half before I was led to the Hebrew alphabet. The 11th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Kaf, in its original ancient Hebrew form, looks like 1111. It's kind of amazing. So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. The 11th letter looks like 1111. And then you could go back and watch my very first video. It's about this. And finally, it dawned on me, well, each Hebrew letter has a number attached to it. Same as it's always been. Kof has always been 20. So 1111 may be pointing to, back then I was thinking, 2020. And it was. That's one of the reasons the 1111 sign was given. Not the only one, but one of them. And I did a video on it in November of 2019. I said, hey, I don't know what's going to happen in 2020, but I think it's going to be a notable year. And I think it was. But since then, people have said, well, I saw your video, and yeah, that, that's very interesting. But people are still seeing 1111. And my response has always been, well, I, I think there's probably more than one answer to it. So, using AD 33 as the date, as the year the Great Commission began, and I don't know that that's the correct date. That seems That is by far and away the most popular year for Christ's crucifixion, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the giving of the Great Commission, 33 AD. And it's an interesting number because 33 years later, the revolt would begin in Jerusalem in 66 AD. So it's kind of interesting. Those numbers have an interesting little symmetry to them, don't they? So just for fun, how many prophetic years since... A.D. 33, yeah, 2020, 2020. Is 1111 striking again? I don't know, but it's interesting, and it's fun. And in this time, with the signs being fulfilled, almost anything that looks interesting should at least be discussed a little bit. But let's separate what's fun and speculative, what I just told you, to the truth. The truth was the first part of this video. That's inescapable. And I hope you will take it to heart for those of you that haven't. For those of you that have taken that step and have returned to the Lord's teaching, I have something very interesting for you to hear in the next video, God willing. God bless you all.